Thanks for joining us today. We are always encouraged to know that God is using this ministry to touch lives all across the world through what He's doing right here in Murfreesboro, Illinois. Please take a moment and share what God is doing in your life by sending an email to info at cccmurphy.com. We trust that you will be blessed by today's message. Last week we talked about joy. Sometimes we think joy is about the stuff we get. We think joy is based on the circumstances or the situations that we're in, and that's not joy. Now it may cause you to feel joy, but that's not the source of joy. If things go bad and you lose joy, then you didn't have the right joy to begin with. Happiness is based on happenings. But joy comes from the Lord. Everybody say, the joy of the Lord is my strength. So it's important that we find that kind of joy. Everybody say, it's a calm delight. It just, it, it just settles down in your soul and it makes you know that it's going to be okay. And so we're going to open a gift today. And before we open that gift, I want to talk to you about how many of you have ever discovered that sometimes you get stressed out? Now, the gift we're opening is not a bottle of pills. How many of you have noticed that sometimes, how many of you have ever gotten so stressed out that it's affected your stomach? You know what I'm talking about? You don't feel like eating you just, you know, you get, it, your stomach gets all tied up in knots. That seldom ever happens to me. But <laughs> nothing usually affects my eating habits. But sometimes you get all tied up in knots and you just, you know, you're thinking, man, I just, you know, and, and how many of you have ever lost sleep? Over, over what? Over stress, right? You, everybody say stressed out. And isn't it odd that this time of year, a time of year that we're supposed to be celebrating is a time of year that those levels tend to go up higher? Anybody know what I'm talking about? We get more stress this time of year, and sometimes that stress comes from, I don't have any money to buy any Christmas gifts with. Which, and I understand that. But what I'm saying is this, is if we're not careful, we're celebrating the wrong thing. And we have to make sure that our focus is centered on him. And so I think about, anybody ever watch Little House on the Prairie? It's a God thing. You know, Little House on the Prairie where they have the Christmas. Did you see the Christmas special? You know, where they, they uh, you know what they got for Christmas? A candy cane and a stocking. Well, I can tell you all going to be stressed out if that's what you get for Christmas. <laughs> but they were excited about it. What I'm saying is that there was a time when things were more simplistic. That when we, we, we kept our focus was more on what it needed to be on than what we put it on today. And so I, I was reading an account about, uh, it was called the Cincinnati Post. It's a paper in Cincinnati. And several years ago, they, they made a decision. They said, you know, there ought to be one day out of the year where we don't put bad news on the front page. I mean, bad news is just, you know, it's something that's got to be reported and it's something that, that we have to, you know, as reporters, we need to do our job. But on Christmas Day, one Christmas Day, they decided that all the thieving and all the murders would go on the back page. And they put, they put everybody that stole something, everybody that killed somebody on the back page. And on the front page, they just put a big banner that said, Merry Christmas. Oh, that got you excited, didn't it? <laughs> what I'm saying is this, is if we'll focus on what we need to focus on, some of this stress will leave us. Everybody say, it'll go. 
it'll just go. I'm, I've been hesitating on opening this because that's so beautiful. Isn't that pretty? They said, can you believe I wrapped that? I wouldn't believe it either. I, I, Debbie, Debbie wrapped this and I told her, I said, babe, I hate to tear that open. That's so pretty. But we've got to tear this open because there's a gift in here that we all need. Everybody say, I need it bad. So I'm going to be a little bit more careful than I was last week. Sorry. Baby, there we go. I got tape on me. Hang on. Tony's going to love me. <laughs> I'm almost there. Hang on. <gasps> Everybody say peace. Thank you. How many could use a little bit of peace in your life? You know, isn't it an amazing thing because you can have all the money in the world and not have any peace. I was reading a story about a man, or it was actually an emperor. His name was Augustus. He heard that a gentleman in Rome, despite having a great burden of debt, slept quietly, took his ease, and was at rest. So he desired to buy the bed that the man slept on. Needless to say, it was a useless purchase for the emperor. He thought if I could just get the bed this guy's sleeping on, then I would be able to rest too. How many of you know that it doesn't always work like that? You see, the peace that he had wasn't found in his bed, it was found in his heart. And that's the, one of the gifts that God brought to us. So what I want you to do with me, I want you to go with me to the book of Isaiah, the 55th chapter, and I want to talk to you about this gift of peace. Now, how many of you think that we need peace? You know, obviously Washington knows that we need peace because they have, they have monuments of peace all over the city. They, they put one up after every war. <laughs> Isn't it odd that the only time we put up a monument of peace is after we've had a big war? <laughs> I mean, think about it. If we really had peace, we wouldn't have to worry about war, would we? If there was really a peace in our heart and a peace in our life. But the, Jesus spoke to us about this in the book of Luke. He said that there would come, this is in the 21st chapter of Luke. He said that there's going to come a time when men's hearts will fail them for fear. Everybody say fearful. But Isaiah reminds us of a time that was promised to a people that there would be one come that would rule on the throne of David and he would bring to us what we've been longing for all this time. It's gone its way. <laughs> he, he, he talked about, and I want you to think about it because it was different for, other, for different people. When, when Christ comes, there are some that are looking for a conqueror to come in and overthrow a Roman army, an empire. But that's not the way he came. And sometimes we get disappointed because he doesn't show up the way we want him to show up. How many of you have ever had a prayer go unanswered? Now, I want you to think about that because I'm getting ready to contradict something on you. You've never had a prayer go unanswered. You've just had a prayer that didn't get answered the way you wanted it to. Are you with me? See, sometimes the answers to our prayers aren't the answers that we want. It's not that God hasn't answered. And if we're not careful, what we do is we begin to ascribe to God that our wisdom is better than his, as if we know what we need more than he knows what we need. And I've learned from life and from experience that I'm so thankful that God didn't give me everything I asked for because he knew what I needed. Everybody say peace. Let's, let's go on a journey looking for this peace. Isaiah 55, 
reminds us of the promise that the Messiah will bring. It says, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy grain and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Simply accept it as a gift from God. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread? And your earnings for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight in abundance. The prophet is speaking to us about feasting on things of God instead of things of the world that never satisfy. He said, there's something there for you that you can't buy with money. There's some promise that being extended to you that if you receive it, it'll make change your life forever. And in retrospect, he looks and he's saying, why do you spend so much money? Why do we spend so much time seeking after things and, and searching for things and, and buying things that, that don't satisfy? How many of you want it? How many of you really ever wanted a brand new car? Wave your hand if you ever really want. Be honest. Did you ever really want a brand new, I mean a brand new car? Hold it up there, Noah. I know you do. <laughs> really wanted a brand new, I really, re, I got one. Ten years ago. <laughs> and, and I still have it. And I've got almost 300,000 miles on that car. Doesn't quite smell the same way it did 10 years ago. It almost looks the same way on the outside, but when you get on the inside, seats wore out where I've been sliding in on it. Isn't that odd? That sometimes we're the same way. We have an appearance that we keep on the outside, and on the inside we're worn and we're weary. And we're frazzled. And God's saying, I've got something for you that can take care of that situation. I've got something for, there's a river that never runs dry. There's joy that's unspeakable and full of glory. There's a place that you can find in him where tears are no longer dominating your life. They're just a reminder that you've got a comforter and someone that loves you and someone that cares about you. And so the prophet is trying to get them to turn their attention that way. He goes on in verse three. Incline your ear to listen and come to me. Hear that your soul may live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercies promised and shown to David. David's been dead for a long time when Isaiah's prophesying. David was the cream of the crop when it came to kings. He was a king that all of Israel looked to and all of Israel, it's kind of like us doing with Washington or Lincoln. You know, he, he was one of the premier, one of the men that would never be forgotten, that, that defined what a king was, that was a man that was after God's own heart. And here's the prophet telling them that the same promise that was extended to David is also extended to you. It didn't end with David. You're just beginning to understand what God has in store. But you've got to incline your heart to seek him. Turn your ear. How many of you have ever noticed that sometimes when you're talking to your children, they have a real hard time hearing Anybody, you know, or, or to your spouse. You know, it, it's kind of like, select, you know, and, and you think, how, you know, you, they're hollering, hey, honey, the trash needs to be packed out. Watching the television. Honey, pack, trash needs to be packed out. Honey, what are you yelling about? Didn't you hear me? I, I didn't hear you. you. You're getting old. You can't hear nothing. What'd you say? 
selective hearing. We hear what we choose to hear. And sometimes we're drowning out God when we ought to be tuning him in. Now listen to what he says. He says, these faithful promises, they've been extended to you just like they were shown to David. Now verse nine, he says, for just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Anybody ever think about that, that God's actually smarter than we are? I mean, we don't want to admit it, do we? And sometimes we act like he's not because we're telling him what he ought to do. God, I can't believe you're letting that go. You know, all you'd have to do is just zing them one time and it's straight, man, man, God, just, you know, just, I mean, here, Lord, just use me as a vessel of judgment. We, we want, we try to ascribe ourselves to take the seat of God. And that's a place I can't set. It's a place I don't know how to set in. And instead, I've got to reach for him and trust him that what he's doing is for my good and his thoughts are higher than my thoughts and his ways are higher than my ways. Now, this is the part that gets interesting because the promise is getting ready to come. Everybody say it's on its way. The rain and snow come down from the heavens and stay on the ground to water the earth. They cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. Now, he just got done telling us that his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts higher than our thoughts. Now he uses this verse to explain that and to demonstrate what he's about to do. He says, I bring the rain down I, and, and, it, and the snow comes down. It stays on the ground and it waters the earth and, and it gives seed to the farmer and bread to the hungry. He said, it is the same with my word. I send it out and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to, and it will prosper everywhere I send it. You will live in joy and peace. Everybody say joy and peace. I, I want you to notice that joy and peace. You didn't even realize it, and there's a promise coming down your dusty road. <laughs> joy and peace. Listen to what he says. The mountains and hills will burst into song and the trees of the field will clap their hands. Now stay with me here because I want you to see this passage in a way that maybe you've never looked at it before. It is the same with my word. Everybody say with his word. I send it out and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish what I wanted to, and it will prosper where I send it. John 1 and 4, or John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the what? Was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, and the Word became and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory is of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth he says I send it out it always produces fruit it will accomplish what I want it to and it will prosper where I send it for unto us a child is born unto us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder his name shall be called wonderful counselor the mighty God, the Prince of Peace, the everlasting Father. Somebody say, it's his word. It's his word. Do you hear what he's saying? He's saying, it's the same with my word. In the beginning was the word. The word became flesh. He said, I send it out and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to and it will prosper everywhere I send it. You will live in and two gifts that he brought. Two gifts that an angel declared to shepherds. I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. If we're not experiencing joy, it's not because it hasn't been given. It's because we haven't opened our hearts to it. We haven't opened our 
minds to it. We're fixated on what we want instead of on what he wants. And anytime you find yourself battling God, you don't find joy. Everybody say joy. And then the angel spoke to them and he said, the, 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 the whole host of angels showed up and they started and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Everybody say peace. Now let's talk about this a second. On earth peace, goodwill toward men. On earth peace peace we say peace on earth but he said on earth peace when you stand what are you standing on what are you made out of everybody say dust anytime dust gets stuck on itself it's mud <laughs> so don't get stuck on yourself on earth, I've been made from earth. He said, on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Here's what his promise is to us, that no matter what you're going through, no matter what your circumstance is, I can give you joy and peace in your heart if you continue to look toward me. How many of you want some of that peace? Want some of that joy? Look at what Isaiah 26 and 3 says. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Everybody say whose mind is stayed on you. Now let me ask a question. Let's all be honest in here. Not that we aren't. But let me ask a question. How many of you have ever had a difficult time keeping your mind on God? Raise your hand up if you've ever had a difficult time. You know, like, I mean, like, you're, somebody cuts you off in traffic. And, and instead of praising God, say, Lord, just thank you for that idiot that just, I mean, I mean, God, I, I just... Lord, I just want, you, you, you know what I'm getting at. We, we can change, we, we, our peace can be taken from us in an instant. That, that quick, that just, you know, that, that. I know it's in there somewhere. Just sometimes I have a hard time finding it. Any of you ever fly off the handle? I always wondered what that looked like, you know. Thought about getting a handle and seeing if I could fly off of it, but you know what I'm talking about. Blow your top, flip your lead, spaz out. We've got all these cute little words and phrases that we describe, we used to describe ourselves. None of us, you, know, you ever notice they don't come up with a phrase like acting like a devil? Ooh. No, it was, I spazzed out for a minute. Just flipped my lid for a second. I just, you know, felt like God wanted me to tell them what I was really thinking. <laughs> After all, you're supposed to be transparent. Strange, isn't it? How we pick and choose what we're transparent about. How we decide what we're going to focus on. Now, I want you to hear me. But any time that my mind has been stayed on him, any time that my mind has been focused on him, no matter the situation, I was in Russia one time about to spaz out. Everybody say he was about to spaz out. 
Nothing was going right. Everything was, it seemed like the people that were supposed to be, first I, I had to deal with a hotel. I got there and they were trying to charge me a higher rate than I'd negotiated. And, and, and so, you know, and I'm trying to be, you know, you, you have to keep your peace, you know, when you, you're dealing with the public. And, and so I, I'm just looking at them saying, that's not what we agreed on. No, not really. Felt like it on the inside. But sometimes you've got to keep your mind stayed on him. Everybody say, focus on him. And I'm telling you, the devil's intent is to rob you of your joy and your peace. Why? Because the Bible said that the joy of the Lord is what? Our strength. So if the joy of the Lord is our strength and he wants you to be a wimp, he's going to go after your joy and he'll do it any way he thinks he can get it. So it may be in your finances. How many of you have ever got all your ducks in a row and somebody declared duck season was open? You know what I'm talking about? You, you finally get caught up. You, you got a little nest egg and somebody comes by and cracks it. Just, just, had, just had gotten finances in order and then my air conditioner went out. And it wasn't just the, I had to replace the whole system and it's gone. And, and, and so I said, well, thank God we had money to replace it. And then after that, a rock jumped out in front of my wife's car and we had to, we, we had to get that fixed. And, and, and then all of a sudden, and, and, you know, and, and then what was the next thing? I backed up, oh, I backed up, I, I backed up in Ed's driveway and he, can you believe he put a post out there with a light on it, man, right in the middle of the driveway and I hit that thing backing up. I thought, come on, Ed. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how we can always, it's always somebody else's fault. It's always, it's always somebody else's to blame. And so, and then, you know, and, and so we've got this stuff that goes on and it's all an attempt to get your joy. It's all an attempt to rob you. That's why I think Job and everything Job is facing, he makes a statement in the beginning of it and he said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. What's he saying? He's saying there's some things that are not up for option. There are some things that I am not going to surrender to my circumstance. My love in him, my trust in him, my joy in him and my peace in him. And so he's able to keep you in perfect peace when your mind is focused on him because you trust him. Everybody say, I trust you, Lord. Doesn't matter the situation and doesn't matter what's, but you, you say, well, now, now check this out. John 14, 27, this is Jesus speaking. He said, I'm leaving you with a gift peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give, this is in the Living Bible, the peace I give isn't fragile like the peace the world gives. So don't be troubled or afraid. I love that. I, I love the way that the Living Bible put that the peace I give isn't fragile. Isn't it odd that we've had in, in the history of the world 8% of the time that we've existed, we've had peace. The rest of the time we've been at war. 8% of the time of the world's existence, we've been at peace. And the rest of the time we've been at war. And over 8,000 peace treaties have been broken. <laughs> what did he say? He said, he knew what he was talking about. He said, the peace I'm giving you isn't fragile like the world gives. So we've got peace. You know, we, we agree. We're going, to, we're going to be at peace with one another. Okay, we agree. We, we, we promise that from now on, I will not cross over on your property and pick up your apples. You. And you stay off my property with your chickens. Okay? All right, great. I told you to keep your stinking chickens off my property. What's wrong with me? 
Do you remember we had, get over here. No, <laughs> we had, you understand? It, it breaks so easy. It's so fragile. Everything that we hold dear, if we're basing it on ourselves, can just, you know, everybody said, well, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Why? Because they know they're going to drop the basket. So they say, just get, kind of spread it out. What are they afraid of? They're afraid that the hands that the basket is in are not capable of keeping the basket. But Paul said, I know in whom I've trusted and in whom I believed, and I'm persuaded he's able to keep that that I've committed to him against that day. Somebody say, God can keep my basket. Look at your neighbor and say, your, your eggs are safe. Philippians 4 and 7, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. His is a special peace. The peace that you find that he offers us when he says, my peace, I give to you. The definition of that word means quietness and rest. It means to set at one again. So here's what God's saying. What separated you from me? What took you out of my presence? He came so you might be brought back into his presence. Everybody say that's his gift. The question is, are you willing to accept that gift and let him in? Everybody say, let him in. Amen. I want to end with this today. There's a true story about a man. His name was Mike. His wife's name, I believe, was Nancy. Or, I'm sorry, yeah, Nancy. And she, she was an insurance agent. Mike had, you know, he, he'd always been healthy. He he built a home for them, and even after he contracted hepatitis, he continued to serve. They lived in Hawaii, he continued to serve. But five years later, his liver was deteriorated and he was dying. They took him, he went to Dallas and he had to get put on an organ list and they made a decision then and there that if they got, when they got the organ, that they would wait the required year that the foundation requires you to wait before you can write to the family of the individual that gave the organ. And so they decided that they would write. This is before he's even got it. His wife said that there was just a piece that came over her, that she knew he would be all right. Five months later, on a stormy night, he got the call. They rushed to the hospital, and he's on the gurney, and they're wheeling him in, and Nancy said, I knew Mike would be okay. And surgery went on for six hours, and she sat in the waiting room, and they came out, and when they came out of surgery, the doctor looked at her, and said, I've never seen an organ in that good of shape before. And so she was excited and she thought, well, this is great. But then Mike wouldn't wake up. He stayed in coma. And Nancy started saying, I don't understand what's going on. The doctor said, we don't know. We can't figure out why he's not waking up. She's sitting in the lobby trying to figure out what's happened and what's going on. And she opens up the paper. And when she opens up the paper, she sees a headline that said, young girl killed in tragic train wreck. And she looked down. And when she looked down, it described the girl. And her heart jumped because she realized that the paperwork they got that talked about the donor matched the description of this girl in the paper. And she just folded it up and kept it put away. Finally, 10 days later, Mike, 
when he woke up, he was in extreme pain. There was a disorder that happened in his brain. And doctors said he, he couldn't come to a full recovery, but to be honest with you, there's only a 2% chance that he ever will. And yet she said, I knew that Mike was going to be all right. A peace settled over her. He continued to grow worse and the pain got so bad that he just wanted to give up. And he looked at her there sleeping and he thought, I just don't want to put her through anymore. And, and I'm, I'm just tired. And he fell into a deep sleep. But when he fell into a deep sleep, all of a sudden he said, I saw a light shining in the distance. He said it was a bright light. And I watched and he said, as I watched, he said, I saw this young girl come into focus. She had blonde, short hair. And she looked at him and she said, he said her hair was like golden honey. He said it's short and, and she looked at him and she said, Mike, don't give up. God wants you to live. God wants you to live. She said, you can do this, Mike. You can do this. He said, he, he, he started asking, who are you? Said, but she was already fading away. But she could hear, he could hear her saying, you can do this, Mike. You can do this. And a peace came over Mike. And he, he woke up and he said, I can do this. I can do this. He said, she was like a cheerleader, man. I felt like I had my own personal cheerleader. And he said, I, I knew I could do this. And I woke up and I told my wife, he told his wife about the vision. And, and she didn't say anything because she was afraid that it might upset him. So she never told him about the paper until later. And he said, he said, I want to live. I, I want to live. And he, he started the next day. He got up in a wheelchair within not long after that, he was wheeling down the hall of the hospital and within I think they said within the month they sent him home he was 70 percent recovered within a year's time he was surfing again completely recovered and she had showed him the article in the paper didn't have a picture of the girl just had an article in the paper so when the year passed, they sat down and they wrote a letter and said, thank you for giving me another chance at life. I'm forever and you're dead. And sent the paper to the organization and the organization forwarded it to the family. They said about a month or so later, they got a letter from Texas. And they opened it up and it was the family of the young girl that had been killed. Donna was her mother, and I believe Sam, the father. And they said, we'd like to meet you. And so they went to Texas to meet. And as they were talking, and they were telling about his ordeal and and they said, they, they, were, they were just telling, you know, thanking them for everything that had happened. And they said, you know, said our daughter was, was a, the youngest nurse on register. She was the youngest nurse that had ever, you know, made it. And said as soon as she got her driver's license, she marked down that she wanted to be an organ donor. And she, he said, and then that night when she had a train, was hit by a train, and they froze because she'd read that story in the newspaper. The mother got a picture of her daughter and held it up to Mike and said, this is my little girl. And his mouth dropped open. And he said, I've already met her. But in the picture, she had long hair. He said, but when I met her, she had short hair. The mother grabbed her mouth and said, after she took the exam, she got her hair cut short and it was right before the train wreck. And he looked at her and he grabbed himself and he said, your daughter 
is still alive. You say, what's your point, pastor? That we let peace slip from our lives. And these people found peace in the midst of tragedy. Because he, my friend, is the prince of peace. And he knows what you have need of before you ever pray. But the young lady died. No. She's still alive in the presence of heaven. In the presence of God. What I'm telling you is this, is that no matter what your circumstance, God can bring peace to you. And in a tragedy where they felt like that they would never, ever know joy. Well, the young girl's, the young girl's name was Sandy. Sandy's parents were on their way to Hawaii to spend some time with Mike and Nancy. And they found joy again in knowing that their little girl's life was continuing to live on. We hope you've been touched by today's message. I wanted to take a moment and just remind you how very much God loves you. The Apostle Peter tells us that it's not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In the book of Jeremiah, the 29th chapter, God speaks through the prophet and tells us that I know what my plans are for you, that they're plans for good and not for destruction, to give you a future and a hope. That's what God wants for your life. He has a plan and a purpose designed specifically for you. And you can walk into that plan and purpose by just asking Him in your heart today. I wonder if you'd take a moment right now and just stop wherever you're at and pray this prayer with me. God, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. Lord, I believe that Jesus was crucified on my behalf that you raised him from the dead so that I could have life. And right now, I accept you as my Lord and Savior in Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it from your heart, we believe that angels are rejoicing in heaven because you've come home. Now the important thing is for you to find a good Bible-believing church and become a part of that as you continue your journey with Jesus. We want to invite you to come and be with us any chance you get. Until then, remember, Jesus loves you, and we do too.